I want to thank Greg for the great job he did last week in the series on interrupting temptation. We're continuing on in that series this morning on interrupting fear. We're in Psalm, the third chapter, and we're beginning in verse 1. It says, Lord, how many are my foes and how many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. How many think that's some prayer? He's asking God to knock people's teeth out. How many have prayed a prayer like that this week? <laughs> One person, okay. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Uh, we were new parents. Rachel was just a couple years old, and Sue was pregnant with Nathan, and we took Rachel just our little toddler, to a park that was about 30 minutes away from our home. It was up by the lake, and, and uh, so we were looking forward to a great day together. At that park, there was a very tall slide. It was over nine feet tall at the top, and so when you're a little toddler, that's like climbing the Empire State Building. I would climb up the stairs behind her to make sure she got up to the top, and then she would sit down at the top, and then I would go down the stairs, and I would wait for her at the bottom of the slide, and she would slide down to my arms. And we repeated this ritual over and over and over again. I went up the stairs behind her, set her down on the top, went down, and when I looked, got to the bottom of the slide, I looked up, and she wasn't there. And I'm trying to figure out what happened. Out of the corner of my eye, I see my wife running very quickly and yelling my name as she moves towards the slide. And, of course, there's no good scenarios that could have happened then. She fell off the back of that slide, and she hit her head on one of the steps uh, coming down. And uh, as you can imagine, for a parent, that's a terrifying thing. She was conscious, and we just snatched her up in our arms, and we ran to the car. We were 30 minutes away from the hospital, and we thought if, if we call for an ambulance, it'll take them a while to get here and, even, and just as long to get to the hospital as it will take me. So we just grabbed her. And on the way out of that little town, there was a convenience store. So I ran in and just bought a bag of ice real quick. We put it on her head and went to the hospital. And they, they did all the scans and x-rays that they needed to. And, and they told us that they thought that she was fine and uh, what to watch out for over the course of the next couple of days. Um, that fear was real and it is normal, and it is healthy. It helps you take the appropriate action in that moment that is required to make sure that someone is okay. You're feeling a lot of strong emotion, and you're very afraid that something bad has happened, but you're not paralyzed by it. You're motivated by it. And that fear can be very helpful. Fear can actually help keep us out of harm's way. If you were walking out in the street this morning and a, and a car come barreling down at you, how many know it's probably wise that you would have a little fear and you'd get out of the way? And if you're one of those people like, ah, it'll stop, well, I hope it does. Um, if you won't feel fear, you'll probably feel pain. Uh, it helps us to take evasive action. It gives us a heightened sense of alertness to dangerous situations. But as it turns out, not all fear is helpful. Some fear is not a result of some dangerous situation that we're about to encounter. It has a different source. And it doesn't motivate us to action. It actually paralyzes us. It makes us afraid. It can come in the form of low-grade anxiety that is just this non-ending sense of, of dis-ease. Or it can escalate all the way to panic attacks where we can't even breathe. It's often vague. It's hard to put our fingers on. We're not sure exactly what the source is or why we're feeling it right now. There's just this sense of impending disaster that's going to happen. You can feel like you're actually caught in a worry trap and you just can't get out. And this kind of fear will not 
keep you safe. This kind of fear will choke the life out of you. It makes it hard to breathe and it makes it hard to sleep. And here's the scary thing about all of it is that you can worry about anything. You can. You can worry when things are going wrong. You can worry when things are going right because, well, how long is this going to last? How long is it going to take for the other shoe to drop? How many have ever heard that expression? Or sometimes one thing bad will happen, and another thing bad will happen, and then there's this superstition in our culture, they come in threes. And oh, and I don't care if it takes 10 years for that third thing, that there it is. You see? It's the third thing. And when the next thing happens, we started another trinity of terror. And uh, we, can, we can be worried about the opinions of other people. We can be worried about our physical appearance. We can be worried about our family. We can be worried about our grades in school. We can be worried about getting married. We can be worried about staying married. We can be worried about our career. We can be worried about money. And if that's not bad enough, you can actually worry about things that you are afraid might not happen. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable the things that we can worry about. And then we come to environments like this, and there'll always be someone that comes up to us and says, well, you know, the Bible gives us a command. Do not be afraid. The Apostle Paul said, don't worry about anything. And how many, when you are worried and you are fearful, and somebody tells you the Bible says not to do that, it just makes you feel completely better. He's, oh, it's like a weight has been lifted off my, my shoulders. No, that's not what you say. Now you feel even worse. In addition to worrying and being fearful, now you are guilty for breaking a command of God. And you just, now you worry God's going to get you along with all the other stuff that's going to happen to you. We just worry more. In our culture, we don't, we don't do emotions well. In our culture, we're required either to completely stuff them down and deny them or we're required to live by them and let them determine all of the decisions in our life. And uh, here's, these are common approaches that people have to emotions in general and fear in particular. So the first is just stuff it. Don't ever acknowledge you're afraid. Don't ever let them see you sweat. Whatever you do, you just have a confident demeanor. You learn how to stand there with no fear and at least look like you have no fear. And then there are other people who just surrender to their fears. Just whatever it is, they run away, they hide, they disengage, they, they can't take it and they're not going to. And these are the common things that occur in our culture, but the Bible gives us a different approach to dealing with fear. And what Scripture calls us to do is to pray our fear. And this is exactly what David was doing in the psalm that we just read. David is running for his life again. And if you saw the title at the beginning of the psalm, it actually says that this was a psalm that was written by David when, when, he, was being, uh, when he was fleeing from his son Absalom who had ordered a military coup and took David off the throne. This was not a good season. The first time David was running for his life, and it was a long season in his life, was when there was an insane, insecure king who was constantly after him, trying to eliminate him. But now it's not an insane, insecure king. It's his own son who's taken the throne away from him. And uh, David needed a kind of fear that's going to keep him alert so that he can stay alive. He needs the kind of fear that's going to help him manage this season, but he also needs to eliminate the kind of fear that's going to paralyze him. And he gives us insights into this passage as to why he would be afraid. One of the things he tells us is that many have risen against him. I mean, if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, maybe you feel confident in that scenario. If it's, uh, you know, if you're a, a super action hero on television or in a movie, maybe you feel good at one-on-ten, but he actually says there's thousands that have risen against him. This is not a good day for David. And more than that, they're also saying that God will not deliver him. Anytime someone says God will not deliver you, it's because they think God has a reason to not deliver you, and it's always something bad that you have done. And by the way, David has done bad things. He is not a perfect king. In fact, uh, he has not been faithful to his spouse, 
and he was involved in an adulterous relationship with a woman named Bathsheba, and it's well known in the land. On top of that, he actually conspired to have her husband killed so that they could hide the pregnancy that they were responsible for. And so David has all of these things that are true. He's not, he's not been a great father. He's not been a great husband. He's got all these weaknesses, and people are aware of it, and they're just saying, you know, maybe this is the judgment of God. Maybe, maybe God's not going to deliver him out of this. And so David starts a conversation with God, and it's an interesting conversation. He prays his fear, and he even prays his anger. And at one point, he's asking God just to smash people in the mouth and knock their teeth out. I mean, hallelujah. I mean, it's just, here's, here's the thing about a prayer like that. Even non-Christians will listen. If, if I stood here this morning and prayed a prayer like that, people who weren't even believers in the room would go, I, I don't think that's, good. is he allowed to do that? Is that, I don't think that's, that feels wrong. And then, and then religious people are the exact same way. Christians do the same thing. Oh, that, no, 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 he shouldn't be doing that. Nobody thinks this is a good idea. So why is it a good idea? And the answer is because David is praying a completely honest prayer. And we're uncomfortable with completely honest prayers. But it is out of this honesty, this gut-wrenching honesty that David has with God, that he begins to begins to gain some insights to help him in the season that he's in with all this fear. The first insight that he gives to us is that running away won't make your fear or problem go away. It's, it's hard to spot this. You probably missed it when I read it. But he says that the Lord will be a shield all around him. Now, when you think about it, you only need a shield when you are in battle. You only need a shield when you are being attacked. You only need a shield when you are way out of your comfort zone and you are in a combat zone. And David does a fascinating thing here. He doesn't pray that God makes everything around him safe. He prays that God makes him safe with everything he has to face and handle. That's quite a different prayer. See, I think a lot of us just want everything to be easier and God hasn't committed to making life easy. God is committed to making life abundant. And there's a difference between those two things. So there are lots of people in rooms like this who think if I show up in places like this and I pray the right prayers and I say the right things and I believe the right things, that everything will go well for me. Everybody in my house is going to be healthy. My kids will get good grades. They will, they will marry good uh, partners. They, they, they will get good jobs. Everything will go well for them. You know, just, just kind of like, oh, it'll be great. And, and the dirty secret is lots of people choose Christianity because they think that's what will happen. And God doesn't tell us that we are exempt from the challenges of life. God promises that he will be with us in the challenges of life. He doesn't say that our life will be easy, but he does say our life can be abundant and full. So let's suppose that God works with you to help a person who's going through a challenging situation, and you kind of speak courage into them, or maybe you're responsible for helping them uh, kick some kind of addiction or find some level of freedom or their willingness to try something that maybe they haven't tried before. And always when that is done, you feel like satisfied and fulfilled. You help someone, and it made a difference in their life. That's just such a good feeling. But if we were to examine your feelings on the front end of that, you would probably have said, I don't feel like I have anything significant to say. I'm afraid I'm going to mess this up. I'm worried that I will head them in a direction that actually discourages them instead of lifts them up. And it's only after the fact, when we went into a situation that felt risky, that we actually feel fulfilled. See, God did not come to make life easy for us. He came to help us make a difference. And so the, the psalmist gained some insight here. Let God be a shield around me. He's going to be in, in combat. He's going to be in conflict. This is going to be difficult for a while. But he's asking God to protect him. So the will of God is not a combat-free zone. And a worry-free zone is not the same thing as a trouble-free zone. The second point is this, is that you need an 
eternal source of encouragement and hope. This is very different from what our world tells us right now. Our world tells us, our culture tells us that you need an internal source of encouragement and hope. You know, if you just, if you go in deep enough, you will find that person inside of you. And then you will find all the strength that you need. Uh, but uh, that's not always true. Uh, often you will feel like things are falling apart internally. And we have all had people in our lives, at least I hope you have, that along the way they've been a source of encouragement to us. When, when, when we felt like we failed, they were the ones who come alongside of us and told us that that wouldn't define us for the rest of our lives, that we would recover from this. There are people that have come alongside of us, and, and when we, we feel like we have messed things up so badly we can't recover from it, they tell us to, to, just to try, just keep trying, that as long as you keep trying, something good will eventually happen. And they encourage us and they mentor us. Now, here's something you should know about all of those people, is they will not always be there. Sometimes they just have other responsibilities, and you call them and they can't pick up. Sometimes they have limited amount of time they just can't always be available when you need them. And sometimes they pass away. They die. And if you've ever had an incredible encourager or mentor in your life and that person passes away, you just feel like nothing is ever going to be the same again. It'd be very discouraging. That's why we need someone who is an eternal source of encouragement an eternal mentor, someone who is always available and always has the time and will never die. That's what we need, and that's what God is for David, and it's what he can be for us. We need God in our lives. So this is what uh, David discovers. He's got this encourager and this mentor. He refused to be defined. This is fascinating to me. He's a guy whose things are not going well for him right now. But he refused to be defined by his failures. He refused to believe that God has abandoned him. Why does he do this? How does he know this? This is fascinating to me. Whatever triggered in his mind that allowed him to think that even though I've messed up as a father and I've messed up as a spouse and I've messed up as a king and right now I'm off the throne and I'm running for my life, I still think that God is for me. How could he do that? And that's because the source of that confidence didn't come from his circumstances or from other people. It came from something that God spoke to him in his life. There was a moment when he was called in out of the shepherd's field. He didn't know what was going on. But he saw a bunch of people who had been collected together, and he saw his whole family standing there, and he saw a prophet that when he saw him, heard a word from God, and he just simply said out loud what God said to him. And he took this great big horn of oil, and he poured it down on top of David, and he said, God says, you're going to be the next great leader of this nation, and God is going to honor you, and God is going to bless you, and God is going to use you and your descendants after you to build a great kingdom in which by all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so in this moment of fear, what he focuses his attention on is what God told him, not just what everybody else is telling him. Please don't think for a minute that this is easy, but it is possible. What has God spoken into your life? He can use others to confirm his word, but they are not the source of those words. They're just the delivery person for those words. Now, some people, when they think about God speaking to them, they just hear a voice that always puts them down and tells them how bad they are and how unworthy they are. And they assume that that's God's voice in their life. And that's because somewhere in their life, they had an uninformed spiritual person who told them that. That is not how God speaks to people. David had been king. That was taken away from him. He had been powerful. Now he is running for his life. He had been praised by many. Now he's being hunted down, and people are saying God will not deliver him. He had painful memories of failing morally, and yet somehow he knew his identity was based on what God said about him, not what other people said about him. Thirdly, learn to consider helping others. How can you help someone else? It's really easy to miss this one, too, because at the end of the third chapter, he says, may your blessing be on your people. May your blessing be on your people. 
David wanted God's blessing on not just himself, but other people that he was concerned for and that he cared for and that he loved. He wanted the nation of Israel to have a king who loved God wholeheartedly. He wanted them to have a king who was wise. And he knew his son Absalom, and he was neither of those things. He wanted them to benefit from the blessings of God. See, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to act in spite of your fear. Now, anybody who's ever gotten married knows what this is like. Because come day of the wedding, everybody's a little bit anxious. We've had people pass out, throw up. I mean, it's just unbelievable what, what can go on. I, I remember, I, this has been about four or five years ago now, I did premarital counseling for a couple who had lived together for over a dozen years, and now they were going to get married. And they actually had a son that was over 10 years old, and he was going to be the best man. And all through the premarital counseling, the guy kept telling me, it's just a piece of paper. It won't make me love her anymore. It's not a big deal. What's the big deal? It's just a ceremony. It's just a piece of paper. And so we came to the day of the ceremony, the day the piece of paper is going to be signed. And it was a location wedding. We were out by the lake. It was beautiful. They had these tiki lamps all set up. When I got there, he was pacing like a caged lion. He was sweating so profusely that he didn't have a single stitch of clothing on that wasn't absolutely drenched. And the perspiration is pouring off of his head. His hands are shaking. His voice is shaking. And I looked at him and I said, are you okay? He said, I don't know. I've never felt like this before. I don't know what this is. I said, I know what this is. He said, what is it? I said, it's more than a piece of paper. It's more than a ceremony. This is the real thing. So cowboy up, cupcake. Go stand in place. Your bride's about ready to come down the aisle. And standing there, sweating profusely, shaking, trembling, he said, I do, and he is still married. Aren't you glad that even when you are afraid, you can find the strength to face your fears and follow through because you actually do love someone more than you love yourself? See, that's the thing. That's what makes it work. There are things, there are some people, if we were to give you a blood test, to even poke your finger, you'd pass out. You just go, ah, and you fall over. And, and then other people, or those same people, those same people, when it's their child is going to have to have stitches now. They'll think, I can't do this. But then they'll hold their child while the doctor's doing the stitches. They'll be in the same room where something that they think would just terrify them was happening. Why do you do that? Because you love someone else. Love is the greatest source of courage. It does not take your fear away, but it enables you to act in spite of it. And David learned these very powerful lessons. It brings me to one more uh, point this morning, and that is this. In Isaiah 41, it starts out, just read the first four words with me out loud. Ready? So do not fear. No, no, just the first four. <laughs> so do not fear. Do, thou shalt not fear. Doesn't it sound like a command? Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not fear. And that's what it feels like to us. But that's not what it is. It's just what it sounds like. This is the exact same thing a parent does when their child is terrified and they wrap their child up in their arms and they hold on to them and they say, don't be afraid. It's okay. I'm here. It's going to be all right. Now listen to it. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The command, it's not a command 
don't be afraid. You're not violating a commandment of God when you are afraid. When you are afraid, don't hide it. Don't pretend in the presence of God. Just pray the honest prayer. God is not offended by our fears. He's attracted to us in our weakness and in our fear. You might move away from him, but he will never move away from you. And you just call out to him, and he is there. That is who God is. Let's bow our heads this morning. Your fear does not anger God. He doesn't move away from you. And he's not angry at you. Instead, he whispers to your heart, and maybe you can hear it today. I can't promise you everything in your circumstance is going to change right now. But listen to what God says. Don't be afraid. I'm right here. It's going to be all right. You will be absolutely amazed where you can go and what you can do when you know God is with you. You don't have to pretend it. You don't have to stuff it. You don't have to surrender to it. You can pray your fears. So right now, just I want you to identify the thing that is the source of the most anxiety to you right now. Maybe it's a physical thing and you're not sure if this is going to affect the quality or quantity of your life. Maybe it's a relational thing between you and your spouse or you and your children or you and your parents. Maybe it's an economic thing and you see the bottom dropping out and you don't know how you're going to meet your obligations. What I can tell you is that whatever the source of your fear is today, you can honestly acknowledge it to God. And he is going to become a shield around you. He's going to protect you in everything you've got to walk through. He's going to take care of you. He's going to help you. Because he is your God, and he is your Father, and he is faithful, and he is here. So, Father, right now, whisper your words of comfort and peace, the assurance of your presence into each and every heart that's here today so that we do not have to pretend we're not afraid and we do not have to surrender to our fears, but we can talk to you about them. I ask that you help each and every one of us process that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together.